good evening. This is usually the time when we do a look round the sky, and I'd like to do that, even though I am going to curtail it slightly, because we've had some very interesting news from America. The summer newsletter is now ready. If you want it, just send a stamped addressed envelope, as usual, to this address, newsletter number six, The Sky at Night, BBC Television, London, W12 8QT. There's always plenty to see in the sky. Let's begin, um, as so often, with Ursa Major, the Great Bear of the Plough. Follow around the curve of the bear's tail, and you come first to the brilliant orange star Arcturus, and then following the curve down to Spica in Virgo. And in Virgo, we still have those three bright planets, Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn, even though they are now past their best and they are starting to go down into the evening twilight. Jupiter is much the brightest of them. Mars is fading now, but you'll still recognize it easily. And uh, Saturn has now changed places with Mars, so the arrangement's different from what it was a little while ago. Telescopically, well, um, I made a drawing of Jupiter the other night, and there it is. Note that the south equatorial belt, that's the one above the center, is now the most prominent on the planet, which is not usually so. And that black spot below center is the shadow of Io, which is Jupiter's inner big satellite, and the one we now know to have active volcanoes on it. Mars is now too far away to show much, but Saturn's rings are opening out very nicely. Another of my own sketches. And you can see there the Cassini division, that gap in the rings. Although we now know, of course, from the Voyagers, that the rings are really immensely complex. Of the stars, well, we are still dominated by what I've called the Summer Triangle, an unofficial name that I gave in the sky at night a long time ago, and everyone now seems to use it. There are three stars in it. Vega in Lyra, and you can't fail to recognize Vega because it's very bright, almost overhead, and very blue. Deneb in Cygnus, the swan, which some people call the Northern Cross, and Altair in Aquila, uh, which you'll recognize because it's got a fainter star to either side. And if you look roughly between Altair and Vega and go up a bit, you'll find the fainter star Albario, which is a lovely colored double, as seen with any small telescope, with a golden yellow primary and a blue secondary. And low down in the south, look out for the red star Antares in the Scorpion. And like Altair, that has a fainter star to either side, but you can't confuse the two because Altair is much higher up and, of course, pure white. And I'm glad to tell you we are going to have a naked eye comet, the first for some time. It was discovered by Austin in New Zealand, and at the moment it's too far south to be seen from here. But it is coming north, and over the next few weeks it will track up from the area of Lepus the Hare, past the twins, and by the end of August, it'll be somewhere near the Great Bear, which means it'll be circumpolar from here and it won't set. Incidentally, I have given the positions, as far as we know them, uh, in the summer newsletter. The magnitude is probably going to be about four. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be brilliant. Of course, it's not. But it should be visible with the naked eye, and it may develop quite a nice tail. We've got to wait and see. The other interesting thing coming up uh, on July the 20th uh, is the eclipse of the sun, a partial eclipse. There was a partial eclipse visible from England some time ago. That's why I photographed it then. But this is going to be quite easy to see. It starts from about quarter past six, and it goes on until nearly sunset. But again, I'm going to give you this warning that I've given so many times. Whatever happens, don't look at the sun through any telescope or even a pair of binoculars. And neither is it safe to stare at the sun with the naked eye. You can damage your eyes that way. If you want to see the eclipse without using any kind of optical aid, well, take a piece of smoked glass, smoke it dark, and I mean dark, and then hold it up and look at the sun. That's all right, but don't do it for long. If you want to use a telescope, then there's only one sensible way to do it, and that is by projection. And I've done this before. I'm not ashamed to do it again. I brought alone, along my faithful old three-inch refractor, and I'm going to show you the general principle. This, of course, is a studio demonstration, not very accurate, but all I want to do is to give you the general idea. First, make sure your telescope's capped up so no light can come through it. And incidentally, don't forget your finder. A very old friend of mine was once making an observation of the sun and forgot to cap his finder. So the sunlight came through, focused all the sun's he heat onto his beard, and suddenly he found that his beard was alight. It can happen. So make sure everything's capped up. The first thing, then, is to point the telescope at the sun by squinting along the top. When you've done that, take away the cap, and after you've done that, don't put your eye anywhere near the eyepiece. Then all you need to do is to hold a sheet of white card or paper behind the eyepiece, and you will see the eclipsed sun, and you'll also see any sunspots that may be around. But do bear in mind that that's the only way to do it. 
And even when the sun is partly hidden by the dark body of the moon, it's just as dangerous as it is when it's uneclipsed. And don't be fooled either if the sun is low down and looks deceptively harmless. It's nothing of the kind. There's one golden rule for looking at the sun through a telescope. Don't. However, let's hope we have a good eclipse. And now let me come on to my main theme. Is there another planet in the sun family beyond Neptune and Pluto? And if so, have we any hope of finding it? The recent work from America indicates that we may. So let's begin by looking at a plot of the solar system. In the middle we have the Sun, and then we have the four inner planets, Mercury, Venus, the Earth and Mars. Then we have the asteroid belt, and then the giant planets, Jupiter first, and then Saturn. And that was as far as ancient astronomy went, because Jupiter and Saturn are bright naked eye objects, and so are the inner planets, and that was all. The solar system was regarded as complete. But in 1781, William Herschel was charting the sky with a homemade telescope, and he discovered something that he recognized as not being a star, and this turned out to be the next giant planet, uh, the one we call Uranus. It's just about visible with the naked eye if you know where to look for it. It's in the scorpion at the moment, in the scorpion's head. I'm never quite sure that I can see it without a telescope or binoculars, but it's quite easy to find. And telescopically, it shows a pale greenish disk, and it's got five rather small moons. Now, when a planet is discovered, the first thing the mathematicians do is to work out how it's moving. And when this was done with Uranus, it became painfully clear that something was wrong. Uranus was not moving as it was expected to do. Something was pulling it out of position. And it was suggested that this something might be an unknown planet still further out. The problem was taken up independently by two astronomers, John Couch Adams in England and Urbain Le Verrier, in France. And they had a, they did a pro problem in cosmic detection. Uh, they could see the victim Uranus, they knew the perturbations, and they set out to find out where the disturbing body may be. And they were right. And when, the, when telescopes were indicate, pointed at that indicated position, there was the new planet, the planet we now call Neptune. Much too faint to be seen with the naked eye. That was a sketch I made recently. Uh, see nothing at all on its bluish disk. Over to the left, you see Neptune's big satellite, Triton, uh, which is considerably larger than our moon. So there was Neptune, just in the expected position. And it's um, rather interesting to note just how this was done, very briefly. So let's give a diagram with the Sun and only the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, Uranus being the inner one. Now, before 1822, Neptune was ahead of Uranus. But Uranus moved more quickly. And after 1822, Neptune was pulling Uranus back instead of speeding it along. And you can see there how the perturbations worked because it does take some time, because Uranus takes 84 years to go around the Sun, and Neptune nearly 165. But that, basically, was the fundamental point behind it. It was also found that Neptune, like Uranus, is a giant planet. And you can see there, they're both much larger than the Earth. Uranus is actually slightly larger than Neptune, but it's not so massive. And, of course, they are quite unlike the Earth, because they have got surfaces made up of gas, and inside they're probably mainly liquid. Now, Neptune came to light in 1846, and everything seemed right. But was it? One man who thought not was Percival Lowell, a great astronomer. There he is with his great 24-inch telescope at Flagstaff. I always think Lowell is rather badly treated by the historians. He was a man who believed that there were artificial canals on Mars, and there, of course, he was completely wrong. But he was a great astronomer, a good mathematician, a good organizer, and he established the Lowell Observatory at Flagstaff and equipped it with that very fine 24-inch refractor that I know very well myself, because I've used it many times. Now, Lowell was convinced that the solar system was not complete, and he believed that there was another planet out beyond Neptune uh, which awaited discovery. So he set out to make the same kinds of calculations as Adams and Le Verrier had done, only this time they were much more difficult because the disturbances were smaller. Eventually, Lowell came to a position where he thought Planet 10 might be, and he looked. He didn't find it, and when he died in 1916, Planet 10 was still unfound. But the search was given up for a time, but then the Lowell Observatory returned to it, and the man put in charge of it was Clyde Tombaugh, then a young research student, and now, of course, one of America's most senior and respected astronomers. And in 1930, Clyde Tombaugh discovered Pluto, not very far away from the position which Lowell had expected. And there is Pluto at the junction of the arrows, and you can see it's very small and very faint. 
That very overexposed star to the left, Delta Geminorum, is only of magnitude 3, so you can tell how faint Pluto is, and of course no telescope will show any detail on its surface at all. Also, it turned out to have a peculiar kind of orbit. It takes 248 years to go around the Sun, and when it's closest in, as it will be in 1989, it's actually closer in than Neptune. And that is so between 1979 and 1999. But there's no fear of a collision on the line, uh, because Pluto's orbit's also sharply tilted, and it doesn't go anywhere near Neptune. That was the first point. Secondly, Pluto appeared to be much smaller than expected. It turned out to be a dwarf planet and not a giant. Well, for a long time, it was thought there might be some mistake there. But that point was cleared up in 1977 when Pluto was discovered to have a satellite, the world we now call Charon. And that's a weird one, too. But it goes round Pluto in just over six days, and that is also the time taken for Pluto to turn upon its axis. So the system is locked, so to speak. But, and this is the vital point, when you know how two bodies are moving, you can find out how massive they are. And it turns out that Pluto and Charon together are very lightweight. And indeed, Pluto's diameter can't be more than about 1,500 miles, and therefore it is smaller than the Moon. And Pluto and Charon are probably made of mainly of ice, so they can't be regarded as proper planets at all. There's an impression of them by Paul Doherty, and from there, even the Sun would appear no larger than the planet Jupiter appears to us, although, of course, it would still be intensely bright. But I think you can probably see what I'm getting at. If Pluto, plus Charon, is so small and so lightweight, it could not possibly have measurable effects upon giant planets such as Uranus and Neptune. And yet Lowell's position was fairly near the truth. Not very accurate, but it's quite good enough. So there are only two possibilities. Either Pluto is bigger than we think, and we now know that that certainly can't be true, or else Lowell's prediction was sheer luck, and I find that very hard to believe, or else the real thing that look at Lowell's looking for, Planet 10, is still out there and waiting to be discovered. But one thing we can be certain about, Pluto is not Lowell's Planet 10. It can't be because it just is not massive enough. So, how can we set about finding the real Planet 10? What about comets? Well, the obvious one here is Halley's Comet, which goes around the Sun once in 76 years. It was last bright in 1910, it's on its way back now, it may be recovered any time, and it'll come to perihelion in 1986. Well, some years ago, Dr. Brady in America made some calculations and found that in his view, Halley's Comet was being pulled about slightly when it was out beyond Neptune, and he worked out a suggested position for Planet 10. But I'm afraid those calculations didn't turn out to be well-founded, and I don't think Halley's Comet's going to help us. And yet, there is another way now, and by sheer luck, we have two artificial probes which may do the job for us, and they are Pioneers 10 and 11. Pioneer 10 was launched in 1972. In December 1973, it bypassed Jupiter and sent back the first close-range pictures of Jupiter, showing the red spot rather nicely. It will never come back. It's now begun an, a one-way journey out beyond the solar system. It'll never return to the Sun. And at the moment, it is somewhere between the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. It was followed a year later by its twin, Pioneer 11, which also went past Jupiter, sending back pictures, but then was given an extra boost, which swung it back across the solar system to a rendezvous with Saturn in 1979. It also is now on its way out of the solar system, and its present position is somewhere between the orbits of Saturn and Uranus. But as you will see from that diagram, those two probes are going out of the solar system in opposite directions. And we are still in touch with them by radio, and may expect to remain in touch with them until the 1990s. And by radio signals, we know exactly where they are, and exactly how they are moving. Suppose, therefore, that either or both of those pioneers starts being pulled away from its predicted track, that might give us a clue to the identity of a body which is doing the perturbation. Well, one man who's considered this very carefully is Dr. John Anderson in America, and I was talking to him about it on the telephone a few hours ago, and he came up with three very interesting ideas. First of all, the perturbing body could be a planet, Planet 10. And there's an impression by Paul Doherty of what it might be like. And that would be so if only one of the pioneers were affected. If one pioneer is, per is perturbed and the other's not, this will indicate that the body responsible is, well, within range, uh, fairly near at hand by cosmic standards, and is almost certainly going to be a planet. But now, just suppose that both 
the pioneers are pulled out of course. This would indicate that the perturbing body is much further away and much more massive. And it could be a dark star, a companion of the sun that's run through its life story and has now used up all its radiation. In which case the distance would have to be something like 50,000 million miles. And after all, double stars are by no means uncommon in the galaxy. And they, they may even be more common than single stars. And if the sun does have a companion of that nature, it will have run through its luminous career, gone through the white dwarf stage, and become a cold, dead, inert black dwarf, but will still, of course, retain its gravitational pull. And the other suggestion is that the perturbing body might be a black hole companion of the sun at something like 100,000 million miles. And that also would perturb both probes equally without any preferential perturbation for one. Personally, I'm not very impressed with the black hole theory because I believe that if there were a black hole within that range, it would have betrayed itself in some way. So, in my view, the perturbing body is more likely to be a planet than anything else, and the pioneers may give us some clue as to where it is. But I can't resist bringing in a rather wild idea of my own. Please don't take it very seriously. It's just an idea. Let's come back to the discovery of Pluto, made by Clyde Tombaugh, not very far away from the position Lowell had indicated. Assume two things. Assume, first of all, that Lowell's prediction was not pure luck. In that case, it seems to me that the real perturbing body, Planet 10, must have been in the same part of the sky as Pluto, only much further out, and therefore so faint that it was beyond the range of the photographic surveys. So let's imagine, therefore, that in 1930, Planet 10 was directly beyond Pluto, or nearly so. Also assume that Planet 10 is about the same size as Uranus or Neptune, and that it is about as far beyond Neptune as Uranus is inside Neptune's orbit. In that case, we can also assume that the inclination of the orbit's not very great. I think that's quite reasonable. So that may have been the position in 1930. We know where Pluto is now. It's moved on in its orbit. And if we assume that kind of path for planet 10, we can estimate its revolution period around the sun. We can estimate how far it's traveled since 1930. And it may have got to the position indicated there. And when you work that out, you come to a position in the sky, in the constellation Leo, possibly not very far away from the star Chi Leonis. Well, as I say, don't take that very seriously. If Planet 10 really exists, it's going to be extremely faint. And before starting a concentrated search, you've got to have a very good idea of where it may be. And no one in their senses is going to start a search near Chi Leonis on the basis of calculations like that. All I will say is that if Planet 10 does exist and was found to be in that part of the sky in 1982, I shall give myself a modest pat on the back. But meanwhile, I think it's now quite definite that the movements of Uranus and Neptune are not quite as they should be, and therefore there is a perturbing body out there. Something exists. Is it a planet, as I believe? Is it a dark star, an old companion of the sun that we now can't see? Or could it be a black hole at a greater distance? I don't know. I still believe it to be a planet, but as time will tell, and we may find out if we remain in touch with the pioneers for long enough, and surely it will be fitting if their final act to mankind is to tell us just where planet X may be, if of course it exists at all. Good night. <laughs>